yesterday's prophecies, today's headlines. This is the Hal Lindsey Report. And now, Hal Lindsey. Good evening and welcome to this edition of the Hal Lindsey Report. Every year about this time, the United States and South Korea stage joint military exercises. And every year, North Korea threatens to use them as an excuse to turn South Korea into a smoldering wasteland. This year, they threatened to take the strongest military counteraction. The DPRK, or Democratic People's Republic of Korea, is the invincible power equipped with both the latest offensive and defensive means unknown to the world, including nuclear deterrence. It's the same old spiel every time, but this year could be different. The reasons have to do with the North's supreme leader and his shaky hold, not only on his power, but on his sanity. In the last few months, Kim Jong-un has embarked on yet another leadership purge. In May, he executed his vice premier because he said something negative about an idea the supreme leader likes. Also in May, his defense chief fell asleep in a meeting. Kim executed him by shooting him with an anti-aircraft missile. These are not the actions of a man who feels security's position. The paranoia runs deep. Two South Korean soldiers were maimed by North Korean landmines placed on the south side of the military zone. South Korea retaliated by restarting a loudspeaker program that had been stopped 11 years ago. The South uses the speakers to criticize Kim and his government. Just loudspeakers and just to voice speaking. Kim responded by threatening an all-out military action. He cannot even allow a few <laughs> loudspeakers on the border to say anything negative about him. He's a pathetic man, but he has a nuclear arsenal at his disposal and a billion people within range of his missiles. Many of those people live in China. Those two nations have long been allies, but China's leaders have shown growing concern about Kim's instability. Recently, China had shock waves of its own, literal ones. On August 12th, massive explosions rocked the port city of Tianjin. The blast left at least 56 dead, more than 700 injured, and thousands homeless, and probably more dead. There were at least two explosions, one of which was equivalent to more than 20 tons of TNT and registered as a magnitude 2.3 earthquake. The blast apparently resulted from a fire detonating explosive chemicals. We still don't know the reason for the fire or precisely what chemicals were involved. Chinese officials, as usual, remain tight-lipped about what they know. Shock waves from the explosion damaged buildings miles away. Another kind of shock wave emanating from China has been causing damage all over the world in recent days. Economic damage. On Tuesday, the 11th, China lowered the value of its currency, the yuan. This is a common technique among nations desperate to sell their goods abroad. When a nation lowers the value of its money, it cuts into the buying power of the people at home, but it makes goods sold to other countries cheaper, giving a temporary boost to their export economy. In the last few years, currency devaluation has been common, but China held firm on the value of its money until last week. On the 11th, the Chinese government devalued the yuan by about 2%. At the end of the day, they reassured the world that it was a one-time correction and they had done all they needed to do. Then on the very next day, they lowered it again. The day after that, they did it yet again. By the end of the week, the value of their currency had dropped 4.4% versus the dollar. In short term, 
That's good news for Americans' consumers. The world oil glut should also cause a gasoline price to continue falling. The strong dollar makes it cheaper to buy anything from abroad. And now, China has effectively lowered the price of all its goods. You should have a few more dollars this Christmas, and those dollars should buy a little more made in China merchandise. But for General Motors, it's a different story. GM sells more cars in China than the United States. Their Buick division sells four times more cars there than in the U.S. For GM, the devaluation of the yuan means fewer Chinese consumers will be able to afford Buicks and Cadillacs. Anything made in the United States will be relatively more expensive. But the problem goes deeper than that. China has overbuilt its manufacturing infrastructure. Ambrose Evans Pritchard, international business editor of the Daily Telegraph, explains, this is the root cause of chronic overcapacity worldwide from shipping to steel, chemicals, and solar panels. A Chinese devaluation would export yet more of this excess supply to the rest of us. That's why presidential candidate and businessman Donald Trump said the devaluation of Chinese currency is going to be devastating for us. Evans Pritchard wrote, if China really is trying to drive down its currency in any meaningful way to gain trade advantage, the world faces an extremely dangerous moment. Such desperate behavior would send a deflationary shock through a global economy already reeling. So why would China, of all countries, be feeling desperate? Economists estimate that the Chinese economy has been growing at 7% a year for some time. The U.S. economy has been growing at about 2% a year. But China has some big problems. A report by McKinsey Global Institute summed them up. Fueled by real estate and shadow banking, China's total debt has nearly quadrupled, rising to $28 trillion by mid-2014 from $7 trillion in 2007. At 282% of GDP, China's debt as a share of GDP, while manageable, is larger than that of the United States or Germany. The International Monetary Fund gives similar data. The massive Chinese economic engine, so often feared by Americans, may be a house of cards. But that's not good news. It's a disaster waiting to happen. This year, the Chinese construction industry is struggling. Financial services are declining. Real estate prices continue to fall at a very steep rate. China's stock market has fallen so dramatically that they've relaxed the rules on debt. They are also encouraging citizens to borrow money in order to invest in the stock market. They've lowered interest rates and increased the money supply. They seem desperate to hold on to the old 7% growth rate, something that every outside economist sees as unsustainable. George Magnus of Oxford University's China Center called the devaluation part of an array of other economic and financial stimulus measures designed to shore up the flagging growth rate. China's desperation to keep that ridiculously high growth probably indicates that they have come to count on such growth. If your plans depend on high increase in income, it can be like running down a hill with a freight train following close behind. You don't dare slow down or it will flatten you. China's not alone in playing currency games with the global economy. The Japanese yen and European Union euro have also been made intentionally lower relative to the dollar. In fact, almost all major currencies have been devalued in the recent past. Yet it hurts the common person. It's not fair, and most significantly, to be powers that be. It hurts the global economy. All the moneyed elites agree that 
this kind of currency gamesmanship needs to end. How could they possibly stop these cutthroat money games? The answer is obvious, a global currency. Meanwhile, increasing economic chaos sets the stage for a collapse of the global economy. In May, Stephen King from HSBC Bank wrote a report saying, the world economy is sailing across the ocean without any lifeboats to use in case of emergency. Desperate times mean desperate measures. A sudden economic collapse could trigger the rise of the Antichrist at breathtaking speed. He will offer a unique, irresistible solution to the crisis. But even without a sudden collapse, we see an inevitable march in the direction of a global currency and global monetary controls. We have recently launched our completely new website at howlindsay.com and we're offering an updated version of our online services. If you have not already done so, please register your new account by visiting howlindsay.com, then clicking on My Account. Visit howlindsay.com today. In our scripture today, the Lord Jesus throws a real hard question at them because they can't answer it without admitting that their whole system is not right. He said in the scriptures right after he had said what are the great commandments, I'm reading from Matthew chapter 22 verses 41 through 46. He said, now while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked a question. They'd been trying to ask trick questions for him and uh, they couldn't trap him. They were desperately trying to trap him with a wrong statement, but they couldn't do it. Now Jesus has got his own trick question. He raised a question saying, what do you think about the Messiah, literally? Whose son is he? Whose son is the Messiah? A trick question, all right, because he says, then, they said to him, the son of David, quickly. He said to them, then how does David in the spirit call him Lord, saying, and so on. I want to point out one thing. What did Jesus think of the scripture? He said, David in the spirit. To read Psalm 110, verse 1, you have to agree that this is the Word of God. Well, the Pharisees did agree on the literal translation of the Scripture, and they believed it's the Word of God. And it's the Word of God because the Spirit of God guided in every word and every tense of the verbs. He said to them, How does David in the Spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put thine enemies beneath thy feet. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? If David called him Lord, how could he be his son? Since they didn't believe that the Messiah was divine. They didn't believe in his deity. It says, and no one was able to answer him a word, nor did anyone dare from that day on to ask him another question. The answer to this question, there are several answers actually, but the answer to this question is really a trap that no one could answer unless they admitted that their whole system was wrong. Because he asked them, who is David's son? They also did not uh, recognize who is the Messiah, really, because they said the Messiah is David's son. Well, how did he call him a name of deity? The Lord of the first part said to the Lord of the second part, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put thine enemies beneath thy feet. You see, the second person here named is called Lord also, 
a name only given when you are in this context as divine deity. So if, if they would answer and say, well, David's son is the Messiah, and the Messiah is a human being, because the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. He was talking about his son. And so if they agreed that the Messiah was David's son, then they're also agreeing that the son of David is not only a human being, but he's also a divine being. He is also deity. And so he had them. They couldn't answer his question. They wouldn't dare answer it at all. So they said no one was able to answer him a word, nor did anyone dare from that day on to ask him another question. The trick questions were all over because they saw they were up against somebody that could ask them questions they couldn't answer. Now, in uh, a scripture back in the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, it unveils in the Old Testament exactly who the son of David is. It says in chapter 9, verse 6, A child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name, that is the son who is born, a human being, born like a human being. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor. Those are wonderful names. But then he says, the Mighty God, Eternal Father. A person is called the Mighty God. You can only call God this name, El Gabor, the Mighty God. And he is the eternal father. He is eternal. And so the son who would be born was also the, the, the son who would be given. And he is the eternal God, a title and a, a part of him was deity, eternity. And the prince of peace, not only the prince of peace, but this is talking about one who is the prince of power. There will not be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom. Born as a son, yet he has all the attributes that God alone can have. The eternal God, the father of eternity, the prince of peace. And it goes on to say, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness. From then on and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Do you think how many times people sing this verse in hymns and it's, it's very clear, but they don't recognize what they're singing. They're saying that the one who is born as, born as a child is none other than the divine being, the king of David, the son of David, and he, is, he has all the attributes of being deity. They couldn't say who is David's son because to say so would make them agree with the scripture. And remember, David is quoting the Psalms, which are divinely divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit. That's recognized. The Pharisees recognize it. So he uses a question that stirs up what they all believe, and that is divinity. And uh, uh, that uh, these, these names, like Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, that's something you could only attribute someone who is deity. This is a wonderful statement in the Old Testament. It's clear. He's talking about the Messiah, the son of David, and yet he is the mighty God, 
the Prince of Peace, the one who is the eternal, one who is the Father of eternity. He is eternal in his being. These are attributes that only the Son of God can have. Now, there's another verse in the Old Testament I'd like to read because it also brings out something that Jesus claims in the New Testament in common talk with people. It says this in Proverbs chapter 30, verse 4, Who has ascended into heaven and descended? Who has gathered the wind in his fists? Who has wrapped the waters in his garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And note, what is his son's name? Surely you know. This is another verse that says God is going to have a son and he has all the attributes of deity. He is both human and he is deity. And I want you to note something. Who has ascended into heaven and descended? That reminds me quickly of something that uh, is in the New Testament. And it says, and I'll read it out of John chapter 3, verse 12. I have told you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. So this ties in with who has ascended into heaven and descended. Exactly the same as Jesus claimed. He ascended into heaven when he was raised from the dead and he went to present his credentials to the Father. Then he descended back again after his resurrection and met with his disciples and with some other disciples of his. Went, but met with the, not only the apostles, but at least 500 disciples. And uh, so he says, even the son of man, once again, the people who asked Jesus questions had run into their match. Mark also comments on this, and I'll read it quickly. Mark said in chapter 12, verse 34, And when Jesus saw that he had answered intelligently, he said to him, You're not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one would venture to ask him any more questions. And Mark brings out, And Jesus answering again to say, as he taught in the temple, how is it that the, the scribes say that the Messiah, or Christ, is the son of David? David himself said, in the Holy Spirit, once again, he's attributing the scripture to be the product directly of the Holy Spirit. He said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put thy enemies beneath thy feet. David himself called him Lord. And so in what sense is he his son? How could David be calling a descendant of his, a son of David, and not agree that he is also the son of God? This is something they could not agree with without destroying their whole system. Jesus had them in a trap. And with that, the Lord had put them to an end. They could not admit that Jesus was the Son of God and also, humanly speaking, He was the divine Son of Man. He was the Son of David, an offspring of His genealogy. With that, you can, ass you can assign only that He is the divine Son of God. He is true humanity and absolute deity. I hope you enjoyed it just as much as I did because Jesus is the Son of God and the Son of David. I'll see you next week, God willing.
You've been watching the Hal Lindsey Report. To support this program, send your tax-deductible gift to Hal Lindsey Media Ministries, P.O. Box 470-470, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 74147. You can also support this ministry online. Visit hallindsey.com or call 1-888-RAPTURE.